The previous lecture concerned the pastor with God. The subject was divided into two parts, the cause of the ministry, the success of the ministry. The cause of the ministry focused upon the supernatural origin and nature of Christian ministry. We didn't reference all the text, obviously. We could have looked at Ephesians 4, 10, and 11. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. We did focus upon 1 Timothy 1.12, Paul's testimony, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Verse 16, the same chapter, Paul said, For this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who were going to believe on him for everlasting life. The great subject of the Christian ministry, as we indicated, is supernatural. The supernatural, transformational work of God in human history. When you, when you think about what God has done in history, why would we want to center our preaching in anything else? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, that thought should occupy ours. God became flesh and lived in this world. Incredible. Why would, why would you not want to talk about that a lot? The invisible God came in visible form in the incarnate Son. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, laying on him the iniquity of us all and spared him not. The incarnate God placed himself in the reach of death. And God administered the punishment that our sins deserve upon him. That was a historical act. It happened in time and space. That's history. That's not mythology. It's not a theological concept. That happened in history. God was within reach in his incarnate son. People could see him. The very glory of God came within the reach of human senses. And then he died under the wrath of God. And then he was raised from the dead. Real time and space. The same one that God didn't spare, but punished in our place, was resurrected from the dead, and he ascended back into heaven from whence he will come again. Those are historical realities. And these objective, historical, and yet supernatural acts of God constitute the subject matter of the Christian ministry. We have a lot of things to talk about that help inform those acts historically, biblically. But when it's all said and done, that's what we're preaching. Our preaching aims at those historical, supernatural transformational acts of God. Now, the great ends for which the Christian ministry aims are equally great supernatural transformational acts of God, the regeneration of individuals, and ultimately, the regeneration of the entire creation. These also are acts of God for which nothing will suffice but the act of God. God must do it. Now, there are many things which the Christian minister must do in pursuing these ends, but can't make any of them happen. 
I think farming, Jesus pointed this out, the scripture points it out. Farming provides a compelling analogy of the Christian ministry. Like the farmer, the Christian minister must cultivate and plant and water and deal with weeds and deal with insects and wait. Cultivate, plant, water, deal with enemies to the crop, and then wait. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for God to give success, just like the farmer. I mean, everything depends upon God and the farmer's experience. A lot of things he has to do, but no rain, too much rain, not enough sun, doesn't work. He's dependent on God. Now, in light of this, we should not be surprised that God alone makes Christian ministers. The church must pray for Christian ministers. Church must take steps calculated to training faithful men to become well-equipped Christian ministers. And those faithful men themselves must do many things in order to become competent ministers who have no reason to be embarrassed as ministers of the new covenant. And yet, as hard as we pray and as hard as we work as churches, as hard as we study as students, we still have to bow before the power and will of the Holy Spirit. He alone creates genuine, effective ministers. There must be, and I know this can get tedious, I I will talk about other things, but my beloved, there has to be a determined, tenacious, God-centeredness on the part of everyone interested in the gospel ministry. There are many things that must be done. But those things must always be done with a very conscious, heavy, weighty dependence on God. Then we took up the matter of success in the ministry, and I very audaciously suggested three components of ministerial success, apparent improvement in the minister himself, maturing, stable church life, a church that is growing, changing, becoming more biblical without losing all the souls on the ship. And then third, the conversion of sinners. Now at this point, I would like to take up still under the major heading of success in the ministry. I would like to treat the source of ministerial success And candidly, this is going to sound very much like many of the things I've been saying. What's the source of ministerial success? Well, first, first, let's acknowledge, let's all acknowledge, fully embrace the principle that ministers must work hard in their callings. And even more, Specifically, they must labor hard for success in their ministries. At this point, I don't want to intrude into some later material, but I do want to blast, as much as I can blast, all notions of passivity or presumption with respect to success in the ministry. It does depend on God. But God wants us to work for it and to work hard. The pastor must work hard at improving as a Christian. I'm often embarrassed by my own Christianity. I'm being honest. I'm embarrassed at things that are fundamental to the Christian life that I don't have down pat. And I'm very much aware I need to improve as a Christian man. And I need to improve as a husband. My children are all grown. 
there's still some parenting that I could do, but it's not in the same category. I, I, I've got to improve as a grandparent. I'm still trying to figure out how to be one. But I, I've, got to, I've got to labor to do that well. I've got to work hard. I haven't arrived. There's still so much work to be done in my own character. The pastor must work hard at becoming a more effective communicator of God's truth. The sermon that the pastor preaches this Sunday should be the very best sermon that he can produce. But the sermons he preaches in five years ought to be distinguishably better than the sermon he preaches this Sunday. One simple factor in improving as a preacher, and I find this painful, but I know it's true, is to receive humbly and sincerely the loving criticisms of God's people. Now, of course, of course, not all credits are loving. But we can come to think that no critics are loving. And so we reject them all. Well, not all critics are loving, but neither are all critics of our preaching our enemies. Some truly love us. They really want us to improve. And some of them love the cause of Christ so much that they want the preaching to be better for his glory. Now, you're going to argue with that. Several years ago, I, along with some other brothers, were called to serve on a church council. The church called us. There were serious charges that had been laid against a pastor. And in keeping with the 1689, uh, some of us were called to, to go to a particular place and, and to hear witnesses um, against and for a particular pastor. That was not fun. And there were, there were many charges, and most of the charges were proved to be unproven. But one of the charges made against this pastor was that he preached intolerably long sermons. Hour and a half. Uh, I, I even heard of a two-hour sermon that he preached. And, and people complained. I wonder why. <laughs> And when the pastor was asked about that, he said, well, I just get carried away with the truth. I, I just can't help myself. A fellow member of the council, and I, I, I've never forgotten this. I, I've forgotten most things that have happened. I've never forgotten this. A fellow member of the council told him, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. And he suggested a very simple plan. When you preach for 45 minutes, stop. <laughs> just stop and then he quoted to him 1 Corinthians 14 32 and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets it was very simple we can fix that one when you get to 45 minutes stop well you know that's kind of funny but it's not funny how many of us need to preach shorter sermons? We say, well, I just can't help myself. Stop. <laughs> just stop. Well, <clears throat> when people are saying, Pastor, um, you don't use illustrations. Maybe you ought to listen to that. Or... I can't figure out what you're saying in your illustrations. Maybe I'll listen to that. Or you're preaching too loud. I've heard that one. Or you're mumbling at certain points. Your voice drops off and nobody can quite hear how you finished your sentences. You ought to listen. My point very simply 
is that pastors are responsible to work with all diligence toward achieving success in every area of their charge. And we would be very wise, very wise to devote frequent meditation on what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 22b and following. And we use this we use this with regard to evangelism, but what Paul is saying had to do with his, his own self-discipline with regard to the ministry. I've become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. That by all means I might save some. He felt responsible for the salvation of sinners. Now to this, this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Do you not know that those who run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable. Therefore, I run, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now whatever else that means, that means that he worked hard to be success. He worked hard to reach men with the gospel. There were things he felt he had to do. And we have to accept the responsibility to be the most effective communicators of God's truth that we can possibly be. I find that hard. One of the things for me personally is really hard is, is illustrations. I often just forget them. I just forget to do them. I have to remind myself, hey, you know, that you probably preached 15 minutes there and there's no illustration. Oh, what do I say? I, I find illustrations hard. Some men, it's so easy. I despise their gift. <laughs> I, yeah, I have to work at that, along with a lot of other things. You always have to work at ministry. Some men are more gifted, but no one is so gifted that they don't have to work hard. Well, hopefully I have established that I'm not advocating passivity or presumption, the necessity of ministerial diligence and labor. But having said that, I must insist again that the pastor's hard work is not the source or the cause of the minister's success. The source of ministerial success is the sovereign blessing of Jesus Christ, the Lord. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. Who makes you to differ from one another and what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Early in my ministerial career, I went to some ministeriums. They were not Reformed Baptist ministeriums. Men would sit around and talk about how many people, how many kids they had in their Sunday school buses. How many people were in Sunday school and how many people had walked the aisle as if they had done it. I hope some people were being converted, but they didn't do it. I hope they were working hard. I hope they learned that gimmicks won't do the trick. But if people were being converted, that was cause for humility and rejoicing that Christ would work. John 4, 35 through 38, Christ said, Do not say there are still four months and then comes a harvest Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I've sent you to reap 
that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. We're not alone in this. When people are converted unto our ministries, if we did some digging, we may find a grandmother who prayed for them and they never knew it. We may find a schoolmate who handed them a tract. We, we may find somebody at the workplace who lived such a powerful witness for Christ that they were compelled to take the gospel we preach more seriously. We're not in, alone. We're not in this alone. We work hard. But very often when we see fruit, somebody else has labored before us. It's Christ's vineyard. He is the Lord of it all. We are simply laborers under him. In 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17, Paul said, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who were being saved and among those who were perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death. To the other the aroma of life leading to, leading to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Always laboring with the, the sense that Christ is watching, looking, that he's doing his work through us. It's an awesome reality that Christ is working every time you minister. You may not see it for years. And the results may not be what you had prayed for, but Christ is working. It's exciting to realize that Christ does supernatural things through our labors. The success that a pastor enjoys especially in terms of the size and strength of his church or the number converted under his influence. That must never be thought a reward proportionate to his labor. Must never think that. If you use that standard, Jesus was inferior to Peter. Jesus labors and he dies, we've got 120. Peter preaches one sermon, 3,000 are converted. The reward is not proportionate to the quality or the labor of the minister. It's the sovereign will and blessing of God. Now, that same principle does not hold for the improvement of our character or the sheer quality of our labors. In 1, Peter, or 1 Timothy 4, Paul said to Timothy, Let no one despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. In these areas... In personal areas, in areas of character, in areas of the sheer quality of our labors, I believe the blessing of Christ is ordinarily proportionate to the degree and even the desire of our efforts. But the ultimate success for which we long is God's to give however God seems fit. I mean, what do we most yearn for? And I do think that this is a question that we as ministers must ask ourselves repeatedly. What is it that I want to happen under my ministry? 
If you're in the ministry now, what, what is it that you most long to see happen? If you're aspiring to the ministry, and let's say after your first 10 years, what will you hope will have taken place? Well, if we're, if we're thinking correctly, the pastor yearns most to have Jesus Christ fervently loved, energetically served by the lambs within the church. We want to see God's people loving Christ more and laboring with greater zeal and energy for all the things that pleases him. The pastor passionately longs that the honor and the reputation of Christ will be magnified by the church within his community. Over 10 years, the reputation of Christ ought to be higher and greater in his community. People in the community ought to have a different view of of church, Christ, gospel, because of our ministries. The pastor agonizes to see more and more people abandoning the worship of their idols in order to become the worshipers of Christ. That's really what we're after, to to gain more worshipers for our Savior. Now, if these things are the primary goals of the pastor, he is going to be thrown again and again upon things over which he has no control. Thrown on Christ. And Christ doesn't tantalize us by exciting noble dreams and visions within our souls. As we labor with him, we gain more and more of his heart. And more and more of his passion becomes our passion. And when he does that, he doesn't do it to mock us. I think we can anticipate there will be success. And I'm probably leaping into some other material here, but a number of years ago, our church very much wanted to have a campus ministry. We have something like 70 to 75,000 college students within 45 minutes of our church. It seemed only reasonable that we should try to reach some of those. And after all, the most reasonable method to try to change a culture is to reach the young people who will become the movers and shakers in that culture. So it seemed a reasonable thing to do. So we actually employed a man to go on a university campus and set up shop to witness to college students. Um, I, I think that maybe one or two were converted. And, and I think that that campus minister did good in the lives of some. And we've heard down the road, one became an NFL uh, player, and, and now he's retired from the NFL, and he's a dentist, and he's a member of a, of a reformed church. And I, I think a lot of that came through that ministry that reached out to him. But God never gave a great deal of success. That was our heart. We worked for it. just didn't happen. About three years ago, Something like that. One Sunday morning, there were a couple of college girls. I don't know how they came. They were at our church. Someone told me later, did you, did you see those girls? I said, well, I saw them. But they said they were taking notes on everything. They were taking notes on the pastoral prayer. They were taking notes on everything. Well, out of that, our church came to become the home church for campus outreach at Elon University. And out of that, we have, I don't know, 20, 25 college students. In the last week, four young men were converted. We now have four, five, six, somewhere in there, college kids who want to be baptized and join the church. Now, do you see the connection? We tried to do that 15 years ago. It wasn't God's time. We weren't trying now. We still wanted it, but we had tried, and we didn't know what else to do. God brought it. That's my point. 
God doesn't excite passion and vision in his people so he can mock them. But it's his time. It's his time. And we have to be aggressive and vigilant and innovative within the proper bounds to try to do what we think Christ wants us to do. But if it succeeds, when it succeeds, to the degree it succeeds, it's entirely up to him. Well, what, was, what can we do to try to, how shall I say, move Christ to give us success? What can we do? Well, the pastor must have unrelenting faith in Christ, in the goodness of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ. And I think the pastor must adhere tenaciously to that very familiar counsel that Christ gave in John 15. You know this passage, I hope. I hope you know it very well. In John 15, where Christ said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He said in verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Verse 7, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Fruit bearing is his design for the ministry. Remember, this counsel wasn't originally given to ordinary rank and file Christians. This counsel was originally given to the apostles, those men who would be the pillars of the church, so that they might be fruitful in their ministries. And this council stands to every generation of minister. And the essence of the council is very simple. Abide in me. Abide in me. As you know, the Greek word translated abide means stay, remain. Same word is used in Acts 27, 31, where Paul said, unless these men remain in the ship... You yourselves cannot be saved. That's that's a fascinating text. God has told me he's going to give me all the lives that are on this ship. Not one will be lost, but you guys got to stay on it. God's appointed the end, but he's also appointed the means. Remain. Remain Christ says, remain in me. The Lord Jesus calls upon us with all of our sophisticated theology, and all of our ministerial tools. He says, I want you to remain in me. Do you remember when God first awakened you by his law? And sent shocks of alarm into your conscience? You weren't the good person that you thought? God was angry with you. You remember that? Remember when your badness became overwhelming to you? Remember what it felt like when you first realized that God was really angry at you? He was angry, and you were frightened. And then remember how you felt when it dawned on you there was nothing you could do. There was nothing you could do. Remember how you ran to Jesus. Remember how you threw yourself on him like a child awakened from a bad dream runs and throws himself into his daddy's arms and feels safe only in his daddy's arms. Remember how you ran to Christ And you threw yourself upon him. And all your sins and your relationship with God and your hope for eternity, you put it all on Christ. Remember that? 
That's the way Christ wants you to live in your ministry. He's calling on you to remain in that disposition, to sustain that same sense of dependency, that same desire for intimacy and confidence. See, Christ was telling the apostles that after the Holy Spirit had come, after the Holy Spirit had begun leading them into all truth, and after the Holy Spirit came to comfort their distressed souls, these honored and favored men would have to do what? They would have to abide in Him. They would have to abide in Him. There's much work to be accomplished. There's much self-improvement to be pursued, much reformation, much evangelism, But everything depends on Christ. And he doesn't want us to become despairing because of that. But he does want us to have a gripping felt need of him. He must give us the faith. He must strengthen us. He must give us wisdom. He must keep us. When we go astray, and we do, he must recover us. And if we're going to be fruitful, he must make us fruitful. Without His blessing. Everything's in vain. You have to feel that deeply. It can't just be a theological concept. You have to live with that reality. Bless my ministry, Lord, or nothing will happen. But he chose you to make you faithful. Your cries, your labors will not be in vain. A source of ministerial success is to abide in Christ. Very simple. There are a lot of things to do. That's the indispensable. Now, I want to turn to the next theme. The pastor with himself. Here we're concerned with the opening directive in 1 Timothy 4.16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine of Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Take heed to yourself. The salvation which grace imparts both engages and requires human activity. If we hope either to be saved or to be the agent of salvation, there are things that we must do. We must take heed That is, be focused. Take heed to yourself. Two quick applications. First and foremost, take heed, stay focused on your relationship with Christ. And here, not to be redundant, when when I'm talking about abiding in Christ, we're talking about living with a felt sense of need for Christ. But now I'm talking about Maintaining the intimacy of your fellowship with Christ. What kind of relationship would you say you're having with Christ right now? I mean, today. Yesterday. What kind of relationship did you have with him? How much conversation did you have? How much seeking of him? All strong, close relationships have to be worked at. Effort is required. That's true of marriage. However long you've been married. But um, I've been married just slightly less in years than I've been a pastor. I became a pastor as a single man. Don't do that. It took me about two weeks to figure out being a pastor was not... For a single man. In 41 years of marriage, um, I still have to work at that relationship. She's a human. I'm a human. Things are happening with her. Things are happening with me. We have to work at keeping the lines of communication free of clutter. Clutter's always happening. You've got to work. Well, that's true of your relationship with Christ. 
If the integrity and effectiveness of the ministry requires abiding in Christ, surely abiding in Christ requires communing with Christ. And that doesn't just happen. There must be purposeful effort. What effort are you making to commune with Christ? See, these are the things we preach to our people. But this is the very fabric of the Christian life. It's interaction with the living Christ. It's spiritual intercourse with Christ. I'm sure you're familiar with the words of 1 John 1, 1 through 4. It provides a standard and a challenge to us in that regard. I'm not going to take time to read those verses. You read them, meditate on them. But I will say this, the electricity, the electricity of our ministries. Do you want electricity in your ministry? Well, I hope you do. The electricity of our ministry depends very much upon our present experience of Christ and the spiritual realities that are in Christ. My wife decorated a beautiful Christmas tree. It really was beautiful. I don't like just white lights, but she even put some few colored lights in there to please the old man. But nobody could see the beauty until the lights were plugged in. Hopefully our sermons are beautiful in terms of order, in terms of the clarity with which we're setting forth staggering truths. But what's going to make those truths electric? What's going to make them shine? What's going to make them compelling to our hearers? It's the overflow of the energy of our experience with Christ. You can't manufacture that. If you're living close to him, he's real to you, your love for him is burning hot, you have a profound sense of his love for you, that's going to energize everything you preach. Now John, in 1 John 1, he was writing out of a fuller, different experience than we can have. But our experience of fellowship with Christ is no less real than his. And it's out of that fellowship that our joy is made full and that we become attractive. We attract others. A fruitful ministry must inevitably deal with hard truths, difficult texts. We have to preach things that the mind resists because they're difficult, predestination, election, before time. Those are, those are profound truths. They're gospel truths. We have to preach those things. But what's going to give life to the dryness is the connection that we have to Christ and that we're able to make between those heavy doctrines and the living Christ. Whatever we preach, our aspiration is to have people gain a deeper reverence and love and faith toward the person of Christ. So taking need to yourself must commence with the daily seeking of the Lord Jesus, actually seeking the experiential joy of his communion. I don't think we ought to feel embarrassed to say, Lord Jesus, I need to be buoyed in my spirit by a sense of your nearness, by a sense of your love for me. I'm dry, and I'm going to come across as perfunctory unless you do something in my soul. I believe Jesus loves to do that. I believe he loves to do that. See, when you seek him, you're going to find him. He is always accessible to us. He wants us seeking. He wants us finding. And, and, and even though the intensity of our experience will vary according to his pleasure, we will be found of him when we seek him. And we will know his help. You know, we may get in the pulpit and we, we have sought him. We pleaded with him. And we don't sense his nearness, but something happens in the preaching. 
and we, we walk away and say, where did that come from? And it's almost like the Lord of glory says, didn't you ask me? Didn't you ask me? Now, in connection with taking heed to ourselves and our relationship with Christ, we must also go to war against those remaining sins which grieve the Holy Spirit and result in a loss of his felt presence and blessing. In Revelation 2, it was Christ who said, I have this against you. Man respects you're faithful, but I've got this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent, do the first works, or else, or else I will come quickly to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So, seeking Christ, wanting to be near him, pleading for his help, that's indispensable, but there's some other things we have to do. We have to go to war against the things that are an insult to him. I want to name four, and I'll be finished. Four of the most threatening sins in pastoral experience. The supreme threat, to my mind, the supreme threat by far is pride. I think it's the main threat to pastoral ministry. And I'm defining pride now not only as self-exaltation, but as self-centeredness, making everything to be about us. That's pride. It's all about me. God resists the proud, as you know, but he gives grace. He gives more and more grace to the humble. If there's any quality that's absolutely essential outside of faith and connectedness connectedness to Christ by faith. It's humility. Pride's the exact opposite. Pride makes us more concerned to preach great sermons than to preach useful sermons. Some of the greatest sermons I ever heard, I can't remember the outlines. I remember the sermon. I remember the drawing, the magnetic drawing to Christ through those sermons. I think there were great sermons, but it's not, the, it's not the order or the structure of the sermon. It was a power to draw my soul to Christ. Pride makes us care more about how people respond to us than how they respond to Christ. Pride motivates private ministry. We engage in private ministry so that people will think well of us rather than that through private ministry we might bring some grace to their souls. So easy to do that. I don't, want to, I don't want to bother with that person again. That person gets under my skin. But if I don't minister to them, they won't think well of me. And they may say something about me. So I guess I need to do it. Why? So they will think I'm a faithful minister. Really? What about bringing grace to their souls? Pride mourns over wrongs committed against us more than injuries inflicted on the testimony of Christ or his church. Pride makes us jealous and critical over the gifts and usefulness of others. When we hear gifted, useful men preach, we say, well, I wouldn't have said it like that. I don't think that was very good. I've got a better illustration than that. I don't see why that guy's so successful, man. I've heard a lot of preachers better than I think I could. Now, I don't know a pastor who would actually, well, I don't know many that would actually say that. But I got a feeling there are tons who thought like that. That would scare us to death. Pride makes us resistant to correction. Pride makes us touchy, hypersensitive. 
I suggest that pride has caused more problems for gospel ministers than all other sins combined. And one of the problems, it's always there. I mean, you beat the thing to death this morning, and it's there full flower in the afternoon. Secondly, the second evil that I will name is unrighteous anger. James 1, 19 and 20, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Dealing with people, even regenerate people, will present multitudes of disappointments, aggravations, and provocations. And some of those provocations are very real and very compelling. And sometimes we will think, I would do well to be angry with you. I would do well to tell you a thing or two. And I think I'm going to do it. Before you unload, out of your self-righteous urges, you, you might do well to remember how patient Jesus has been with you. How many times have you cowered expecting that a boulder was going to hit you in the head and you knew you deserved it? And after perhaps days, weeks, and you admired the patience of the Lord, maybe that's how you ought to treat that sheep that's getting under your skin. Or maybe you ought to remember the warnings of Christ about those servants who thought he had delayed his coming, and so they began to beat their fellow servants. Correction and rebuke well, they belong to our charge, but they must always be ministered with long-suffering and compassion. Our objective must be to recover and restore, not to inflict pain and punishment. And within two hours after writing those words, I got a report concerning the, the behavior of a church member that made me angry. And I'd just written those words within two hours. And the only way I could deal with it, because I was really angry, was to have some very extended and repeated dealings with Christ. A third troubling area, my time's almost gone, covetousness. Read Paul's testimony in Acts 20, 32 through 35. We live in economically difficult times, but most of the churches that love truth show their love for truth by paying their pastors very well. And we must take heed against the danger of covetousness and loving money, wanting money. The final most threatening temptation, as you would expect, is sexual lust leading to physical fornication and adultery. I didn't look this up, but if I remember correctly, Focus on the Family has calculated that 50% of evangelical pastors in America are addicted to porn. 50% addicted, not 50% who occasionally visit porn sites, 50% who are addicted. Surely this is one of Satan's great successes in our generation. Do I need to tell you that indulging your flesh in that way violates the spirit of the seventh commandment? Grieves the Holy Spirit? Bloodies your conscience? And sets you on a slippery path toward personal and ministerial ruin? But you know what? Addiction to porn actually is. It's addiction to self-love. It's a blatant expression of self-centeredness. And it will have other manifestations. 
It won't just manifest itself there. It will manifest itself in the way you treat your wife, the way you approach the ministry. It's fundamentally self-centeredness. And my brothers, if you, if you have problems with that, you spare no means to kill that sin. I don't know if you saw the movie Fireproof. Excellent movie. Remember what the guy in the movie did? He had to take a baseball bat to his computer. So I can't live without my computer. Oh, you can't live a lustful life. If you have to use Strong's for the rest of your life, then use Strong's. Save your souls. Save your ministries. Well, there's one other application of this, and I'll save it for the next lecture, but I want to tell you what it is. Cures for crippling ministerial depression. Now, I hope you don't have problems with ministerial depression, but if you're in the ministry long enough, you probably will. I'm afraid I have a lot of experience with ministerial discouragement, depression. First session tomorrow, I want to deal with that. What's that prayer? Father, you've told us that in many words, sin is not lacking Many words have been spoken by me in the last two hours. And I'm quite confident that not everything was said as well as it should have been said and perhaps not as truthful as it should have been. Please forgive the sins of my tongue. Please blot out the remembrance of those bad things, harmful things. But the things that are true and good, make them stick in my soul, in the souls of my brethren, that we might be more faithful and more fruitful than we have ever been to the glory of your Son. Amen. Amen.